everyone. My name is Dave Campbell. I'm with FirstNet. Uh, joining me today, I've got Ben Munn, who's the product manager for security at FirstNet, and uh, Del DeCock, who's a systems engineer with FortiNet. And today we're going to be talking around um, our offering EDR as a service, as well as the managed offering around that. Um, we're going to be demoing the product and just talking around some of the key concepts around that. But I think before we be, before we kick off, um, Ben, you've had a long experience with Fortinet. Uh, you're NSC seven certified. Um, why are we playing in the EDR space now? Tr traditionally, FirstNet has been a, a cloud service provider. We've been a connectivity provider, telephony provider. Why EDR now? A and how how was our decision made to partner with Fortinet over and above other EDR vendors in the market? Yeah, sure. Yeah, Thanks, sure. man. So, um, Fortinet, FirstNet and Fortinet have had a very long-standing partnership. We've been uh, working together for over 12 years. Um, that's made us one of the top partners in SA and, and has given us a wealth of technical and sales knowledge uh, in the Fortinet brand. And this has given us the chance to grow a, a, a very large base of, of existing customers from, uh, from a FortiGate perspective and, and other Fortinet offerings. And because of this, it was a no-brainer to extend our security offering using 40 EDR. Um, it, uh, we're able to now touch right down to the desktop level and integrate into the security fabric, which gives us some great uh, analytics and visibility um, into the customer's network. And it allows us to, to integrate seamlessly as well as giving us the best of breed technology. And I think with security, often you've got sort of point solutions not communicating well to each other. And, and, and you mentioned security fabric, and that's quite key. So an example, we could leverage um, a customer's existing FortiGate fi firewall, or perhaps a, a VDOM subscription with us. We yep. could perhaps quarantine an infected desktop off the network by using that synergy between those, those, those two devices or two solutions. Yeah, 100%. So... As you said, we can integrate into a customer's 40 gate. It can be an on-prem 40 gate. It can be a VDOM hosted in our cloud. And um, using that security fabric, we can make sure that EDR is talking to the 40 gate, and we can we can stop and, and mitigate um, traffic uh, with uh, within a few microseconds uh, to ensure that uh, devices are not communicating out and, and reaching out to command and control centers. Uh, um, yeah. Right. Thanks, Ben. And Dell, maybe let's let's just talk around um, the landscape at the moment. Um, let's talk about ransomware. Why it's such a hot topic? Uh, one of the other topics people are talking about at the moment is Poppy. How does this? Um, how does EDR or how does ransomware play into that Poppy conversation? Uh, what is the landscape at the moment? Where are the problems that we're trying to to solve? Hey, thanks, Dave. Uh, thanks, Ben. Also, just from a fortunate side, obviously delighted to be working with uh, FirstNet on this. I think it's quite an exciting area, uh, the whole sort of endpoint detection space as well. Um, so I've, I brought up a quick slide to actually sort of highlight the three core areas that I think we're seeing the majority of challenges from, from an endpoint perspective. Um, I think with the whole shift to remote working, I think organizations sort of had to adapt overnight to, to kind of the, the, the challenges or the changes that that brought about. And I think we've seen three core areas. So from a visibility perspective, the sort of ever evolving sort of threat landscape, and then also from a skills perspective uh, to making sure that organizations have got the skills to, to combat to these sort of threats in real time. Um, firstly, from a, from a visibility perspective, I think the, the next initial question we really need to be able to ask is, with this whole shift to remote working, do we have visibility into what's happening on our endpoints uh, if they're on the network or off the network? Or is it a case that we've only got visibility, uh, say, when they're on our network and when they're connected to the VPN sort of three hours a day? And, and visibility also needs to go a bit further than just when our antivirus goes and says, hey, something bad has happened. We also need to understand what's happening sort of on a normal day-to-day -day basis within our, our endpoints to understand what are the vulnerability on those endpoints? Um, what, are, what are the legitimate applications that attackers typically look to leverage off such as PowerShell or PSExec or these remote login tools that allows them to kind of go undetected in the environment as well. Um, and then also from a threat perspective, it's just um, watching the news, reading the news, I think over the last 18 months, we've kind of just seen that that huge exponential growth in, in ransomware type activity as well. And, and why the growth? I mean, what, what's changed? What, what's made the growth uh, so exponential? Uh, I think it's, as I mentioned a bit earlier, they, the kind of how 
organizations had to adapt overnight to kind of working uh, remotely. So kind of what this has resulted in is really sort of a massive widening of the attack surface that these attackers can kind of go after. If you take the, the typical challenges that organizations have had in the past around just patching endpoints, that's got a lot harder now as those endpoints aren't even on the network. Um, when it comes to a lot of the endpoints are getting affected by going to just malicious websites. Previously, it was a case of they behind the firewall, you can restrict what sort of websites they need to go to. Um, your users are working remotely and uh, they need to go and install a printer at home. Um, so we're having to give them local admin rights. And all of the attackers are kind of leveraging off all of these sort of weakening of security goal controls to actually go and target these endpoints. But at the same time as well, they, they've had so much success off, after the last sort of 18 months that they're getting more and more money. They're getting better funded. That's allowing them to kind of have better security research into discovering zero day vulnerabilities, into working out um, how to bypass your typical security controls. Um, and ransom itself has become a, a whole sort of supply chain type uh, business now where you've got organizations that was focused and specialized in a certain area. So maybe it's access brokers that have already compromised your network and they're selling access. You've got malware developers that will provide the actual ransomware and they'll give you SLAs to guarantee that it's uh, that it won't be detected. Um, and, and things are changing as well. So, you know, everyone's talking around Poppy at the moment. It's, it's the hot topic. Um, talk to us around how, how Poppy has a relevance with ransomware and specifically around a, a business that we've been so used to in the past. Offsite backup has been one of the primary defenses against ransomware in the past. You know, if all else fails, revert to backup. Um, yeah. Don't pay the ransomware. But, but even if you don't pay the ransomware now and you have a solid backup, let's talk around some of the risk and how that affects Poppy and how that changes the game. Yeah, so exactly that. So attackers are, are kind of aware. They understand that organizations are getting better at the backups. Um, but kind of what we've seen now is a sort of twofold uh, sort of attack. Um, so previously, we would have been aware with sort of organizations, um, they, they're going to go and sort of encrypt your data and kind of lock you out your data. So you could go and put your hands up and say, yes, we were hit by a ransomware attack, um, but we're going to go and revert to a backup and we'll kind of take the the, the risk of losing one or two days worth of data. But now the attackers, what they, they're tending to do is as soon as they've compromised an endpoint or kind of compromised your network, they're looking to exfiltrate whatever data they can get their hands on. Um, and also what's interesting on that side is that once they get access to those endpoints, they're kind of installing those legitimate applications. They'll install a cloud backup utility and they'll use that cloud backup utility to exfiltrate all of your data. And then they'll go and hold you to, they'll then go and do the encryption um, and then they'll hold you to kind of ransom. So you either pay to get access to your data or from an extortion point of view, they're going to go and say, OK, if you don't uh, pay us the ransom, we're going to release your data onto the dark web. So from a poppy perspective or from a GDR, GDPR type perspective as well, uh, you're now facing either the brand damage or uh, the potential fines because, uh, uh, what do you call it, PI data has been sort of leaked out into the dark web. And I think that, that you know we were talking about it be, be, before our, our session today is that that reputation damage. I mean, a classic example: I got a notification of a breach from a, a flower delivery company that I'd used once or twice, um, and, and my inclination is not to use them again because I don't know what data was lost in that breach. And you know, you would never think of a flower delivery company being you know that con they're concerned about security, but yet they could lose customers who traditionally buy their services online. Uh, yeah, and I think with Poppy coming into effect, one of the, the changes has been so previously maybe if you were part of a um, sort of an attack, uh, maybe there would be some sort of news publicity around okay that organization got breached, um, and you kind of hope your customers maybe didn't go and read that. But now with Poppy, if any of your customer data potentially has been leaked you need to actually take that step out and you need to notify those customers to go and say, hey, Mr. Customer, your data has potentially been sort of compromised. So you're kind of sort of advertising that sort of bad news. That, that's also going to take it a step further. People are going to be saying, well, actually, I'm, I don't think I really want to do business with you. I'll go somewhere, somewhere else where they haven't been compromised. Let's talk about skill shortage. And, and you know, I find it quite, quite funny. A lot of slides where you talk around a business's uh, security center and, and the analyst team. Uh, I mean, in my experience, most of the SMEs that we work with, you know, it, it's a it's a couple of guys in RT, and they they do everything. Yeah. 
Um, right. Let's talk around skill shortage and, and, and how, you know, how, how we solve that problem. Uh, yeah, so I think it's, uh, often we talk sort of that, that um, analyst sort of fatigue in the security operations center, but never mind uh, where those organizations don't even have a, a security operations center and it's the guy in, a, in IT that's already sort of wearing multiple hats and now he's got to wear this additional sort of security hat as well. Um, and he's also aware of all of these sort of ransomware attacks that are kind of happening. He's got his CEO coming in and saying, hey, what are we doing about kind of this attack? Um, and, and quite as a case of, okay, well, they go and invest in sort of extra security tools and with additional security tools, there's, there's more alerts, there's more noise, um, and it just even gets harder for these guys to actually focus on the stuff that, that's relevant. So that's particularly key where sort of EDR solutions need to actually provide a higher level of sort of automation to actually go and say, okay, we now, we've had hundreds of indicators on a, a daily basis that, that's kind of telling us that our, our network is under attack. But what we can actually do with automation is go and say, okay, well, you don't have to look at a hundred things. There's sort of five or six things you kind of need to go and look at. Um, and by using that sort of automation within the solution. And then when we do respond to something that is malicious, how we can automate our response it's by going and saying, okay, well, uh, that's malware that's phoning home. Let's automatically go and block that IP address on the 40 gate, like, like Ben mentioned, or we've got an endpoint that's compromised. Let's go and isolate it from the network. Um, but then also similarly, if we've got a user who's working from home, he's had a bit of malware um, and we go in and we can effectively clean that machine remotely uh, to make sure that that machine is not going to get compromised when they go and reboot, because um, that saves that endpoint from having to be couriered, that laptop coming back into the office, then having to kind of reformat that laptop, which is again, what a lot of organizations are kind of having to do because they just don't know if they've dealt with that attack su sufficiently. Oh, great. I think the best the best way to see how the product works is probably demo it. And I know you've got a demo environment, so let's maybe simulate a few attacks and and, and showcase how the product works. And, and and maybe I think in your demo as well, a lot of our customers will say, well, I already have an, an antivirus solution. Um, I think we need to talk around the next generation antivirus yeah. and, and that whole detection and response and how that whole thing fits together. But I'll, I'll leave this to you. 